Thank you, Lorena. I appreciate your help, and you helped me a lot yesterday. And Manny from OIT. Carlos Diarza is here, who is a genius, who is filming this, but he does everything. In fact, a lot of these things I'm going to show you, he put on DVD and then put on YouTube. So uh, we're in good hands here. And then the young man outside here is Troy Valeriano, one of my students. And he, by the way, is a Canadian, and my, my mother was a Canadian, so we have a good a good affinity, a good affinity with each other. I have one handout I want to give you right away. This will be rather chronological. In, 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 starting from this National Public Radio thing I'm going to play for you, um, going up to the present. So but the order of my speech where I'm going to do, or I'm going to give a couple little talks and play some DVDs and things for you. The order is roughly uh, chronological. So let's pass it. Uh, why don't you take half these? I'll take this. Um, this was when, when the Pope was in Cuba. Oh, you already got these. Who, who needs these? When the Pope was in Cuba before he came to the U.S. a few months ago, NPR ran this story. They came and talked to me, and then they ran this story. I got a few calls from people all over the country, so I guess it aired nationwide a couple of times as well. It was on the air here in Miami four times. Um, I never heard it, but fortunately it was also online. So let me play the uh, story of Father McCarthy. Now, a lot of you old timers, of course, know McCarthy as the, the man who founded the university, right? So. Let's see if we can listen to. I think the guy who who did this uh, did a good job. That's a, this is of course a picture. How's the light? The light here. This of course. That's, that's of course a, that's of course a picture of the university uh, in Havana. I've been to Havana four times, and every time I've gone out there, and it's still standing. But I mean, the first few times I went there, it was very pathetic. It was all boarded up. Uh, it, was, it was boarded up. It wasn't really boarded up, but, it, but they had the chains on the doors, and inside it was, uh, it was used as a storage facility. The cha I'm, I'm speaking of the chapel here. And uh, you couldn't see a thing, but since then, they, they, since then they've removed all the boxes and things. Hilda was over there recently, yes. right? Yes. And, uh, but the first time I went in the 70s, I guess, it was really bad. But since then, we, we, we even had an art exhibit where one of our men here took a lot of great photographs inside the chapel. Um, so here you're going to hear about Father McCarthy being arrested, et cetera, at, at this beautiful campus they had on Fifth Avenue, Quinta, uh, Quinta Avenida, right? Fifth Avenue, it's just a beautiful location. The ocean is just over here. It's a lovely part of Havana. No one seems to worry about using an inside voice at the St. Thomas University Library. Oh, it can be pretty loud. Well, isn't that, it's on you to maintain order. You would think, but I don't feel necessity. <laughs> Jonathan Roach is the interim dean of the library. He pulls out this giant black and white photo from the 40s or the 50s. That is cool. It's like an aerial shot from an old movie. There's a Dick Tracy looking car driving down a boulevard lined with palm trees next to a little Spanish chapel. That's the picture of the campus in Havana. The campus in Havana of the Uno Universidad de Santo Tomas de Villanueva. What was Havana like in those days? Delightful. It's one of the nicest cities you can imagine. This is an old interview with Father Edward McCarthy, who died in 1996. McCarthy was an Augustinian friar and was sent to Cuba from Philadelphia in 1946 to help found Santo Tomas. He eventually became the equivalent of a vice president there. The university had law and architecture and business schools and, according to McCarthy, a reputation for working students pretty hard. I've always felt that had we had 10 more years, we would have had a very first-rate university. They did not have 10 more years. With Fidel Castro's rise to power, a private Catholic university with Americans on the faculty would not fit into the new Cuba. The breaking point came less than 20 years after the school opened, in 1961. On April 17th, the communist island was invaded by freedom-loving Cubans. The day the United States launched the Bay of Pigs invasion, things fell apart at Santo Tomas. McCarthy said Cuban militia surrounded the school. This group came in and told us that we had to remain 
in our house there and that we were under arrest. McCarthy was moved into an auditorium that had become a makeshift prison. With people with machine guns, submachine guns, following your every motion. Somewhere else in Havana, just hours earlier, Fidel Castro had stepped to a microphone and officially declared Cuba a socialist state. Eventually, McCarthy was released, got to the Swiss embassy, got on a plane to the United States. When he landed in Miami, his provincial was waiting for him, his Augustinian higher up. And driving downtown in a taxi, he said to me, Ed, the bishop wants to start us to start a college here, and we're going to accept it, and you're the president. Unbeknownst to McCarthy, the bishop of the Archdiocese of Miami had been trying to start a Catholic men's college. Miami already had a Catholic women's college, now Barry University. With Santo Tomas collapsing, with a suddenly unemployed group of Augustinian friars fleeing Havana, the timing worked out. McCarthy left Havana, a vice president, and found his next job before he'd even reached downtown Miami. So I was unemployed all the way from the Miami airport to a taxi. In May of 1961, the Universidad de Santo Tomas officially closed. Barely a year later, in Dade County, with McCarthy as president, a new school opened, named, of course, Biscayne College. What? Are you expecting something else? I remember one of the early students said that he decided to come here because we were named after a car. This is Richard Raleigh. There was a model of Chevrolet called the Biscayne. You may recognize his voice from the questions on those old recordings. What was Havana like in those days? Raleigh has recorded hours and hours of interviews about the end of Santo Tomas and the beginning of Biscayne College. There probably would have been a Catholic college in Miami, a men's Catholic college, even if it were not for Fidel Castro because they had already bought the land that you see here. They being the Archdiocese of Miami. In 1984, when Biscayne College became a university, it took the chance to pay respect and change its name to St. Thomas University. It was an homage to, to our history. And by then, there were hundreds of alumni from Santo Tomas living here in Miami. And it was kind of an, an honor of them as well, because they were, I think, very good in supporting the university. Raleigh, who's an English professor at St. Thomas, says he's not sure many students really know the school's backstory. The Bay of Pigs, friars under house arrest, submachine guns. I mean, come on. Certainly seems like a cooler story than, you know, my school was named after an old Chevrolet. I'm Kenny Malone in Miami. That uh, was taken... When you heard McCarthy's voice, that was from something else I'm going to play you right now, I think. Um, I've got three or four, well, I guess three here. The faculty I want to introduce you to or remind you of. You'll get a chance to see them and hear them talk for a little bit. First, Father McCarthy, the founding president of, of the college that this school is a successor of that. It is not, there's no connection at all. It's just an accident. St. Thomas. St. Thomas or Miss Gang, yeah. Uh, What happened was here that in 1957, this was created as a diocese, dividing the then one diocese in the state of St. Augustine. And Bishop Coleman Carroll was made the first Bishop of Miami. There was a college here that had then been operating about 17 years, Barry College for Girls. And he was very anxious to have a counterpart of that for men. And what he wanted really was just a liberal arts college. He sort of consented to having other things put in, such as business and so forth, but he was interested in, as many people are who have that type of education, a philosophical and religious-oriented and uh, humanistic education. Uh, So he had tried to get uh, several orders of people, priests, to accept this job of putting a college here. He started first with the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost Fathers, as they call them, run Duquesne University, because he was a graduate of that. He was an alumnus of Duquesne. And they just didn't have the manpower. Then he tried to get Holy Cross priests from Notre Dame. They were, didn't turn him down completely, but they were debating it and they weren't at all sure they could 
handle it because of other commitments they had in three or four other colleges. Uh, the result was he didn't have anybody. And just about that time, we were expelled from Cuba, which meant about 18 men came out of, 18 Augustinian priests came out of Cuba. And uh, that was the time that he approached our provincial to see if the Augustinians could take a college here. And uh, had we remained in Cuba, we would probably have been the same as the other two orders. We wouldn't have been able to. But since he had this release of manpower, he decided, our provincial council decided that we would accept this invitation. So I was unemployed all the way from the Miami airport to a taxi uh, because we came out of Cuba one day and uh, the provincial came down to meet us at the airport here and uh, had made reservations at a hotel downtown, I think the Columbus. And driving downtown in a taxi, he said to me, Ed, the bishop wants to start us to start a college here and we're going to accept it and you're the president. That was the search committee. Uh, so <laughs> that's how I became the first president of Biscayne. So I went home because I hadn't been there in a while. and <clears throat> My mother had died earlier that year and spent some time with my sisters up in Troy and then came down here at the end of July of 1961. Uh, what I saw here was a town dump, very literally. There were no buildings of any kind, of any shape on here. There was one bulldozer down at the south end of the property, digging a hole for what became Pace High School. Uh, the school for retarded children on the other side of the property came several years later. On the grounds here were old bathtubs and uh, stoves and junk that people drove by in cars and just dumped here, that's all. Was the thing. So that meant a, you know, a clean-up job. I'm going to stop it there. This was a, we had up for a while this program where faculty could apply for a, a thing called the Sullivan Award, named after Bobby Sullivan, the other priest who co-founded the, the college. And uh, so I went around and visited uh, the old, some of these historic figures who, who are all deceased, all but one, I think, are deceased now. And of course, Father McCarthy was probably the first one I interviewed. Uh, I have something here that kind of strange. You'll, th you'll think I'm very odd, but don't, but uh, if you'd pass that around, there's something in that book that they're peddling out in front. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you read the the back of it, the uh, um, by the way, the the one who really deserves credit for this is the poor woman who uh, had to do had to listen to all these tapes I recorded and then typed them up. I'm afraid I've forgotten her name. That's a shame. Uh, but I wrote the introductions, and I and I tried to put, it, I tried to piece together all of the interviews so that they formed a story. And I wrote the transitions, and I wrote the epilogue, etc. But I'm just going to read this last two or three, this last paragraph. Really, they were the the graduating class. And I guess there are no, there's nobody here from the first graduating class. And I was sorry to see that, because they had, they told me they had a party. At, at the Miami Lakes Club. It, was, it wasn't called Don Shula yet. Don Shula bought it later. And, but there was the new Miami Lakes Inn that had just been built on the, at the curve of the Palmetto. And that's where they had the gala, the final party. I think eight, eight or nine people graduated. And, uh, and, I, then I, and I write about that party. And here's my last paragraph in the book. But let's go back 15 years to that party at Miami Lakes, the night of the first graduation in 1966. One of the parents is posing Father Sullivan, Adrian Roberson the father, and Father McCarthy for a picture. They're holding drinks, and Adrian is between the two priests. The photographer is setting the flash, and the room is full of joyful noise, and Father Sullivan is chuckling to the others 
and over the noise, you can just make out him saying, oh, this picture will be a treasure. Nobody will appreciate it but us. But we know we were the ones who got Biscayne started, whatever happens from here on. And, I, and in, the, in, the, in, in this book, you'll hear Adrian Roberson talk about that the, the, the beginning of Biscayne College. She was the first employee of Biscayne College. She had been driving along, I guess, 20, uh, 32nd Avenue and uh, saw a sign, future site of Biscayne College. And um, she, ca she called the number and uh, talked to Father McCarthy or Father, or Father Sullivan. And they said that they would then come over to her house and interview her for the job. And um, uh, that's, that's what I just hand, handed out to you there. I, but I didn't get my copy. Uh, you all got this? In other words, I decided w w the, the beginning of the college were these, here it was, a, it was summertime. It was probably 90 degrees, 95 degrees. Uh, she lived in Carroll City. There are all these canals up in Carroll City bisecting it so it can get confusing how to get places and Father McCarthy and Father Sullivan in trying to get to Adrian Roberson's house up there around 183rd Avenue or something uh, were stymied by actually two canals that were intersecting they couldn't figure out how the hell to get across the canals to get to her house she she saw them from her front window she went outside and she started waving <laughs> And Sullivan or McCarthy yelled over, how do we get over, how do we get across the canal? And then she laughed and she pointed and they eventually made it. But I mean, to me, that's the first, those are the first words of Biscayne College. Uh, these, these priests, very uh, oddly dressed in their black suits in 95 degree weather in the, in the, in the summer of uh, Florida, yelling at this woman, uh, how, do, how do we cross your canal? And that was the start of, that was the start of Biscayne College. And then, by the way, they gave her a little test uh, where she had to type something. And she said she put the carbon in upside down. Uh, for, for those of you, those of you, uh, I know, for, those, for those of you who know what, a, what carbon, paper, carbon paper was, and so she said, she thought right then she'd blown it, that they wouldn't hire her because she couldn't even put a carbon paper in right side up. But they hired her anyway. And as he said there in this book, that's, that's a very historic picture. The three of them, these two people and the very first employee um, uh, starting the college. Um, I could tell you another a little quick story Well, yeah, I'll tell now. Uh, when I first came down here, I'm going to read you a little piece where I didn't really tell this part. When I first came down here, all the way down from Michigan, driving by myself, took me three days. My car had no air conditioning. And uh, I got here exhausted. And I forget how I was dressed. I don't think I was in shorts. But I thought, let me go and check out this college and maybe say hello to somebody and then start trying to find a place to live. So I went in the, ba the main building, which was this building then. It was pretty much the only building here. And Adrian, of course, was here. And again, she was the only civilian I saw. And uh, I went up to her office. She was the president's secretary. And the president's office was down here, Father McCarthy's office, and the door was ajar. And I said, I'm Richard Raleigh. I just came down from Michigan, and I've been hired here. I'm going to be an English teacher here. She said, oh, that's fine. And I said, I'd like, if I could, may I speak to the president, to Father McCarthy? She then got on the phone and called Father McCarthy in his office over there. Again, his door is a little bit open. And she said, uh, oh, yeah, uh, oh, yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. And then she hung up, and she said, uh, uh, Mr. Raleigh, perhaps you'd better come back another time when you're properly dressed. 
I thought, wow. And I, I, almost, I almost thought, this is not the place for me. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and drove back to Michigan. But, I, but, I, but of course, then when I went to the fir my first class, which I'll tell you in a few minutes, I found out that everyone wore coats and ties here at Biscayne College, whatever the weather might be. So as I say, if you want to go up and see the beginning, this is where Adrian lives. She's no longer with us. The family doesn't live there anymore. But, uh, and then you know, I, wrote, I wrote, it's not really a poem, but I thought, think of, think of how many lives were changed by that action uh, of these three people, what, it, what, it, what it's turned into, all the marriages. Uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible what building a college, starting a college does to thousands and thousands of lives. So, and I took, of course, photographs of that and everything. Um, sunscreen. Read sunscreen. How about a sunscreen? Can you, friends, my, my, one of my dearest friends, Frank Helene, is here. C could you open that blind back there? So they can, I want you to look, that, uh, look out there. Uh, no, just, 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 you know, just the slats. Don't, 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 don't pick it up. Just open the slats. Open the slats. What I want you to do is look out at that sunscreen. Stay there because I want you to close it in a minute. <laughs> Been here a long time. This is a photo. This is the this the, this is the photograph that made me come down from Michigan to teach here, uh, and I'll tell you about it in a second. But just look at the photograph and how, how in what way is the sunscreen different in this photograph and and now? That's right. That's right. That's right. Now maybe may. Maybe when, when these guys were here, they, they would hear these cracking sounds. They thought it, were, it was hunters hunting, <laughs> hunting you know, animals and things like that. Hoods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it, the campus was wide open. Anybody could come on. And so for a long time, they thought it was hunters or somebody. And then, of course, they found out that they were cracking. And that started, started to collapse. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, of course, the solution they came up with was filling them, which really destroyed the, be destroyed the beauty of the screen. That, that, this, this was a new architectural thing. A guy named Jarrell Stone uh, pioneered it. He did, a, he did the American, the U.S. Pavilion for a huge World's Fair a couple years before this building was built. And that sunscreen was his trademark. And so that, a guy, the architect for this building was a guy named Brennan. And Brennan copied this Jarrell Stone's concept of the sunscreen for this, for, this, for this building. As I say, when I saw that, I thought, wow, what a futuristic uh, uh, building that is. It must be a beautiful campus. But, um, let me just read you then my little, thank you, thank, thank you Fran, Fran, for that. You did very well. <laughs> they ask me sometimes, by the way, this is, uh, I never like to get stuck having to listen to something. I'd like to I know how long will this be going on. This, this will take me nine minutes. Are you all set? They ask me sometimes how I happened to come and why I've stayed for several decades. I think, it's, I think it was the sunscreen of Kennedy Hall that got me here originally. I had come down to Boca Raton for spring break in 1966 and visited Marymount College where a friend had just taken a position. He let me guest lecture his class. Later we adjourned to the faculty lounge for a coffee. It was there I spied the pamphlet that changed my life. It was titled Four Catholic Colleges in Florida. And despite the fact that it was a joint venture, it wasn't much of a pamphlet by today's standards. Just a page folded twice with a few black and white photos. But the facade of Kennedy Hall in the Biscayne College section caught my eye with that tile 
sunscreen that later lost its sleek space age appearance when they had to fill the tiles with concrete because they were buckling. I was from Michigan where all the colleges were old with ivy on the red brick and snow a foot deep this time of year. This Biscayne College looked like a clean, well-lighted place to me. And until that day, it had not really dawned on me that you didn't have to pay to live in this magical Florida, that if you played it right, someone would pay you. When I got home, I decided to write these people with the neat sunscreen on the building named after my favorite president. <laughs> well, I guess I played it right because they gave me the job but when I arrived at Biscayne the following fall, I was a little disappointed to find that Kennedy Hall, while a nice building, was one of only four buildings, <coughs> and that it wasn't even named after John Fitzgerald Kennedy, but after some rich lady who used Mary Kennedy as a pen name when she published her little religious stories and small Catholic publications. I asked Father Skelly, the Augustinian priest showing me around, if we could visit the buildings at the southern end of the campus that I could see across the way. But he said, no, that was Monsignor Pace High School. <laughs> that what I saw here was pretty much what I was gonna get. <laughs> I was feeling kind of bummed out and lonely and tired after the three day drive down and the oddly brief tour of the campus. But then I found a brand new apartment house with a big interior fountain near the Westview Country Club to live in and an open windowed Florida style bar, a three minute walk down 27th Avenue where they served you Ballantine beer in 32 ounce frozen mugs for 25 cents. <laughs> you knew that, you knew that. I, I thought maybe I'm getting into something good. <laughs> My freshman students scared me when I walked into class for the first time a few days later. All boys, and all of them wearing coats and ties. It looked like a gathering of child accountants. <laughs> maybe they were going to audit me or something. I was pretty young myself, and their clothes were better than mine. I lost the winning edge. I liked it better back in Michigan, where the students wore jeans and letter, 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 and letter jackets from their old high schools, and it was clear who the teacher was. It wasn't long before a few of the young Turks on the faculty convinced the more tradition-bound administrators that all those modest jackets weren't really that necessary in Florida's 90 plus temperatures. And before you knew it, they were all wearing shorts and sandals and Grateful Dead t-shirts. And some of us wondered if we hadn't made a mistake. We didn't look like Oxford or Cambridge anymore. I think that's the key to the, th to the whole thing, how much the college has changed. So when they bring up that business about staying at the same place so long, I think to myself, it sure doesn't seem like the same place. When I came here in 1966, there were about 350 students, the great majority of them living in two new dorms. Four years earlier, Biscayne had opened as a college for boys from the local Catholic high schools, but they had only managed to attract 34 students that first year. And after their second year, half of them transferred to better known institutions. They decided to build dorms and they were filled immediately with northerners delighted to go to school in Florida. The infant commuter college had become a resident college. The college founded by the Bishop of Miami for the Catholic men of his diocese had become a haven for kids from Philadelphia and New York and Hackensack and that would be typical of the changes I would see in the next several decades. They were almost all Anglos in the beginning, mostly Irish, a lot of Italians, but soon the Cubans started coming, and then others from Central America, and the West Indies, and later on from all over South America, and later on from all over the world. So that now when I'm teaching James Joyce, 
I'm lucky if I can find a single Irish name on my seating chart. <laughs> we have students from more than 40 countries, but what has become of the Irish? <laughs> In the 70s, the complacency of the young men was shattered by the appearance of women and then cops studying on federal funds. The old bookstore was turned into a rathskeller. Suddenly, we were no longer all male, young, and abstinent. <laughs> we had classes at night and a graduate school and a second campus for adults. We had a pool, a professional football team, a motel and convention center. The drinking age was 18 and a freshman could go to the Rathskeller after his Thursday night class and spend the night playing pool with the chief of police of Miami Shores, an Anglican bishop on convention, the publicity director of the Miami Dolphins, and the odd professor or two. <laughs> By the mid 80s, we had 10 times the students we had when I first came to Biscayne. And we had to buy 100 bunk beds for the dorms to, to accommodate the crush. We added still more campuses in Kendall and Broward. We built a new library and a law school. One morning, as dawn was breaking, a stately chapel miraculously arose out of the earth, becoming the first building to greet the weary traveler as he entered the campus. Later, a state-of-the-art science building went up, then a high-rise dormitory from whose top floor you can see the row of condos along the Atlantic Ocean stretching all the way to Miami. And then, wonder of wonders, the building that would dare not speak its name for almost five decades appeared in the mist at the far west of the campus. A gym. <laughs> a gym so beautiful that we would not think of calling it a gym, but rather a wellness center. So the campus now stretched from 32nd Avenue to 37th Avenue. And for me, when I started going regularly on the Spain program in 1983, crossing the Atlantic Ocean more than 50 times so far, for me, St. Thomas University, was not just those several blocks, but several thousand miles. So I laugh now when I remember Father Skelly telling me with great regret so many years ago that he couldn't show me the rest of the campus because it was pace. <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, you'll, th this is also from my class list from, I think, maybe, maybe around 1972 or 73. So you can see the ethnicity of the, uh, of the students. And you'll see maybe one or two uh, Hispanic names. Um, changed quite a bit. Um, Raul Shelton, how many of you remember him? Remember, remember, remember Shelton? I love those old Cubans. I swear to God, they were to me so amazing. And Shelton was one of my favorites. Um, so again, part of this series I did, you can see the date there in 1989. Uh, and with Shelton, it was kind of fun. With Shelton, also with uh, with Citarella, uh, I actually went to their homes, and it was kind of funny, fun to see the to see how they lived. Shelton was an amazing guy. He knew Hemingway in Cuba. He had the biggest General Motors dealership or something. He was a millionaire. Plus, he also taught, probably for fun, at, our, at the university there at Santo Tomas. He was, a, he, he was a, a Renaissance man. He was a painter. Uh, he wrote a history of Cuba that was 20 volumes long. And then as he's, maybe it's in this part I'm going to show you, he, um, it says when Castro took over, he, he, lost two or, he lost two or three million dollars and came to Miami with 
$13,000. And again, within three or four years, he was living beautifully once again with his family. And so I just want to show you, I, I kind of want to show you his house. He lived in the country club section of, of Coral Gables and it's filled with his paintings. And so let me just show you a bit of my conversation at uh, Raoul Shelton's, Raoul Shelton's house. And by the way, the first part is really jumpy, but it clears up. And that's a, I love that area of uh, Coral Gables where they have the park and the, and by the way, he has two houses. There's a house behind that that he also owned. That was for the kids. <laughs> bought, a, bought a house just for the kids. And of course, that, that's Raul, you see him? Yeah. Hey, here, it's beautiful. Uh, just as we came in, because I used to live in the, in the country club, uh, country club Marianao. And the, the name Country Club Prado had a ring for me. So uh, we came here and uh, I bought that first house, the number uh, 990. And then uh, it's a story, it's a romantic story about uh, the owner of the house wanting to buy it back because uh, she had cancer and she was going to die and she wanted to die in the house where she had uh, built her, her family. And she changed, it. he was an architect, and he changed this house, which was brand new for the other one. Takes care of the. Hmm? You have a gardener? Yeah, yeah. Your grandfather's very yeah, famous. With my granddaughter. Right. How do you like living here? I love it. It's, it's a blast. <laughs> we have a great time. Who? Happy. So you bought this home what year, Ralph? She's already working. Good. Can you tell me a funny story about living here uh, the, on the night of January 1st without any heating or something to qualify for the... Well, yeah, when we moved here, it, was, uh, it had to be before uh, December of, uh, of that year. And uh, it was a cold night and I had to sleep here with no furniture or no nothing just to be here, living here before the 1st of January. So it was a cold night. And so you have some of your paintings here, too, right? All of them. Most of them are here, right? And they live, in, they live in the back. There's another home in the back there. And, uh, this is your work here, bro? Mm hmm? Yeah. These are all four nine, but you don't want to show that. Sure. <laughs> As your company's assets grow, so is the thing you collect on top of it. What you need is a network to better manage money, people, property, and equipment. USF and G Asset Management. Well, we're speaking with Raul Shelton. Raul, you're. Your name is not, Shelton is not a Spanish name, is it? No, it's not. It, it, it's an English name. My grandparents uh, were English, although they lived in Scotland. Apparently they had moved from England to Scotland before they came to Cuba. And my uh, great-grandfather came to Cuba. He was uh, in the shipping business and in the banking business, and he came to uh, the uh, oriental part of the Cuba, Santiago de Cuba, where I was born in 1911. That was 77 years ago. That's hard to believe. You you look like you're in very good shape. I do. I do keep in good shape. I play tennis, and uh, I'm I'm at peace with the world and with myself. He shows all of his paintings here. Well, who do you use for models? For these? Just imagination. I have one of his paintings, by the and way. And these are some other paintings of mine.
This I like. And then there's a little shot of his swimming pool. Let's move on. Uh, Marie Vargas, one of the most amazing people I've ever, I've ever met. Everyone loved Mar Madame Vargas, everyone. And she was full of stories. She was raised in, in France, equally at home in France and Cuba. Uh, Marie Var let me just say that Marie Vargas is talking here. She, her, her husband was in a Cuban jail for 20 years after they invaded after they snuck into Cuba with their dog Cinc with their dog Cinco and uh, and f that was the big drama her husband's in a Cuban jail finally he got out we flew up there to Washington to meet him along with John Zarella one of our graduates who was who was in charge of cable news network and it was amazing he was he was on the front page of Miami Herald the next day because he spoke Jesse Jackson was the one who got him out but he was the most important of the political prisoners of that bunch. So it was big news. But the tragic thing, I, hate, I don't even want to mention it because it's so awful, but they had a horrible, tra horrible accident. And uh, uh, Marie and her husband, her husband was driving. Uh, just a few years after he got free from prison and came here to Miami. And I visited her in the hospital, and I swear to God, I prayed that she would die. I did not think she could recover. She was unrecognizable. It's amazing uh, what bruises can do to the human body. I, and, and what you're seeing here is Marie three years after that accident. And in the film, which I urge you, in this video, which I urge you to watch, she describes all the reconstructive surgery she had to have at the age of 69. All her whole face had to be reconstructed, etc. And you're seeing her now after all of that horror, and she's just a, so beautiful and lovely. She loved the boys especially, and I think it's cute, cute at the end here if I can do it. I'm not sure I can. Uh, as she leaves her classroom, these good-looking young men come up under under both of her arms and escort her out. It's just to me a cute scene. She taught humanities, humanities and French. What was the title, Madam? Well, because she was French. Because she was French, yeah. yeah. Uh, but a million stories about Madame Vargas, I'll tell you. Uh, I'm running out of time here. Uh, I do have another handout of. You don't mind. I'm going to show you a couple of videos. I think you might enjoy them. A few of you are in them. Um, this is where we're getting into some. This was taken. This I think this might be the oldest movie ever taken um, that you could see uh, taken at, at at Biscayne College. I bought. I borrowed a. I borrowed a camera, uh, a super, one of those uh, Super 8, Super 8 cameras from a friend of mine. I'd never used a camera before and started shooting movies, old fashioned movies where you got to bring the film to the lab to have it developed. And so I think you're seeing things here that maybe, I've never, because I never saw any kids with movie cameras back in the 70s. Uh, so let me just show you a bit of this. As I say, you guys from the 70s are in it, drinking. <laughs> Surprise. We never did that. <laughs> and there is no sound, by the way. So we've, we've solved the sound problem. <laughs> wow, 
And it started raining, so they'd gotten their Volkswagen to get out of the rain. And those are all carrying beers. Now you'd be, you'd probably be expelled now. Yeah, see that? You can see how expert I was at my photography. Yeah. Uh, but that's a baseball game. I'm going to fast forward through most of this. Uh, those are the Batgirls. I don't think they were our students yet. <laughs> they hadn't they hadn't arrived yet. I don't believe the the women. By the way, we have one one of the, one of the original um, females students with us. Is that right? Brian. Yeah, the original five seventy three. Thank you so much for coming. Do you recognize these women? Are, are, there are only four I yeah. But these girls are from Barry, Barry College, and they're the, the bat girls. Let me move on to go through some of this. This is interesting. This is footage of us playing at um, University of Miami. And my friend Frank Colleen, who's in the back row here, was one of the top hitters on the team. And his buddy, who he still sees, Joe Croak, actually beat the uh, University of Miami in this game. So that was historic. And then Joe was the first pitcher to, uh, to win seven games. Uh, those are dolphins, by the way, in the back, right? Yeah, do yes. <laughs> I, I, saw Ra I saw a rafter there. Did you see a rafter? I transferred this uh, from movie film to a VHS cassette, and then I transferred it to a DVD. The pool was quite new then. <laughs> you, when you go out to the pool now, you see very little activity, but you, you guys use it a lot. There he is. Here he is. Here's the man. They do another one of those pyramids, I think, mm -hmm. which is pretty good. Don Shula, Don Shula's office was right there. He came out one day and he said, man, college isn't what it was when I was in school. Because yeah. <laughs> they, they, they had a bar, an open bar out there. Oh, here's their. Oh. <laughs> Can you guys still do that? Oh, 
That was a priest there. That was one of the priests. Oh. He... Oh, this is, these are the guys giving speeches in my speech class. Um, Fran, were you with these? Paul, Paul Cornwall. Yeah, right. And then you'll see, what you're going to see in a second is they would have these parties. They, all, they had the rat already, but then they also had parties on, like, of course, we had, we had school Monday through Friday. And on Friday, af Friday afternoon, there would be parties out on the lawn between the cafeteria and uh, Donlin Hall. And they would have a, a bar, or they'd have a keg, and they'd, and they'd, and they'd bring a band. They'd ha have a band there. And they just had a lot of fun. Uh, and this other handout I gave you mentions that, that. It looks like they're having a lot of fun, but they also did a lot of work, and they went to class five days a week, and they didn't have all the toys that you have now. They, didn't have, they weren't allowed any televisions in their rooms or anything like that. Um, they had carbon paper. They had carbon paper. <laughs> And they knew how to put it in. Uh, I, let me just get. Seventy-three. I cannot drag this thing. I want to show you the party on the lawn. There you go. That the guy you just saw there was Frank Colinas. <laughs> It was in the back here. There's your friend Turpak, right? That's Frank Colleen once again. You're in all these, Fran. There's the, there's the band they had. That's Jimmy O'Malley driving in in his in his in his station wagon.
Is Gerard, uh, is Gerard here? That's Gerard Burns. He's supposed to be here. Listen, I'm really sorry. I have another, I have another video I wanted to show you, uh, it, w taken with my, the first video camera I bought, which was around 1986. And I have, that was going to be my next video, and it's very, there's some funny stuff in it, like going to an evict, some, some of the kids had an eviction party. They were evicted from their, from their apartment house in Miami Lakes. So they invited me to their, the, their eviction party. And they showed me the eviction slip, and I left before the police came. Uh, well, there are a lot of funny things in in that um, in that film. Some of them, some of the, these people saw it yesterday when we were trying it out. But I realized the time that I've already gone 15 minutes over. I also wanted to read a little short piece um, that I wrote, actually 30 year, 32 years ago, and I delivered. I just I discovered it the other day. And it was funny because I, I, I gave the speech 32 years ago, but it was, it was like a back to the future thing. It was science fiction where I predicted what would the college be like in, guess what year, 2016. And I had this old professor showing this boy who was down from New Jersey around the college. The boy was thinking of coming to, coming to school here. And the old professor shows him around. And it's a beautiful piece. I, I choked up in reading it. Um, because I thought, in looking at it, I thought, my god, this old man who I wrote about 32 years ago is me. <laughs> it's, it's become me. And, uh, and it ends with him saying how much he enjoyed all the years he spent at Biscayne College, St. Thomas University as he waits for the train home, which at that time, by then we had trains. It was, it was kind of fun to see what I predicted. We, we, had a, we had students who had been the presidents of Cuba. We had, we had one, of our, one of our graduates was worked for the Foreign Service on Mars. I mean, it, it's, it's a cute piece. Maybe I'll mail it to you or something. But I, I really think I'll get in trouble if we go on much longer. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah.